the scripture tonight is this concept of one flesh in two parts. Um, humans are two-part beings. Now, I know that there are some who believe they're three-part beings and this and that. The reality is, those, if there is a three-part being to man, it's made up of two parts. The material and the immaterial. The part that you see and the part you don't see. The, I know there's the thing of the spirit, soul, body. That's not the whole point of this. There are two fundamental aspects to what a man is made up of. A human. He's got a spiritual aspect to him and a physical aspect to him. Spirit, soul, body, flesh, so on. And those two parts are confusing by themselves. You ever thought about how convoluted just your life is? You ever confused yourself? You ever not really sure what you were thinking when you were thinking something? I mean, we are confusing beings. It's a part of the way God designed us. Now, I'm not saying He designed us to be confusing, but He designed us very intricately. The human makeup is not simple, which is one reason why it's just impossible for me to imagine that we came about by random processes. We are intricate. But then you take another aspect to it, and these two-part beings, God says, should be joined together both physical and spiritual, both material and immaterial, not only joined into one person, but God has a plan for those two parts to be joined together, to be joined together to another person with two parts. Two becoming one flesh is the way the Bible describes it. That is not a simple concept. Um, marriage, although your husband may eat like a pig, and although your wife may be finicky like a cat, we are not animals. We are not animalistic in our behaviors. The world paints marriage in that portrait as animalistic. It's just, just mating is what it is. And you, you, by the way, you hear those arguments, don't you, for marriage today? Well, animals engage in this kind of behavior. Animals have many partners. Animals, you know, you hear psychologists say, it's unusual for, for man who is just another animal, for man to have one partner for their life. Because animals don't do that. Or animals engage in homosexual behavior and Somehow that's supposed to mean that then it's okay for humans to do these things. The reality is we are not animals. God made us different than he made the animals. He spoke, he brought the animals into existence by the word of his power, and then he formed man from the dust of the ground. And then he breathed into man the breath of life. We are a distinct, separate creation, and therefore we have to get our understanding of what it means to be one flesh from the one who breathed into us and gave us the breath of life and made us a living soul. Not from animalistic behaviors, not from society, not from these things. Now we'll talk more about that tomorrow morning. We'll talk about the covenant of marriage and where it comes from. Ephesians 5.31 is a familiar passage regarding marriage. I want to read that. It says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Now, in the King James Version, there is a word in there that's not uh, expressed as well as it could be. It's the word be. Because it's not just the being verb in the original language there. It's the word become. And so the idea of this in the original language is not just they will automatically be one flesh, but God joined husband and wife together to become one flesh. The difference between be and become is the idea of a process. God's intent is for us who are married to be in the constant process from the time we come together to the time we leave this world to be becoming one flesh. That indicates something to me. It indicates that it's, there's no magic pill, there's no magic formula that's just going to make me one flesh with my wife. It's going to be a process. It's going to be a series of trial and error. Tomorrow we're going to spend more time examining the basis of marriage and specifically notice that marriage is a covenant relationship, not a contract. A contractual relationship is dependent upon the other one upholding their end of the bargain. If you're in a contract and someone backs out, you're free to back out, right? 
You'll find out in Malachi, the Bible describes marriage not as a contract, but as a covenant. With God as a witness of that covenant. A covenant's different. A covenant is where two people enter into an agreement, not based upon the other one upholding their end of the bargain, but based upon the one who witnesses the agreement. Which Malachi says, God is the witness between the husband and the wife. So marriage is a covenant. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Yes, it is important, and it takes two to make a marriage work, but I also believe it usually takes two to make it fail as well. Um, one of the most common causes for trouble in marriage, and even the dissolution, the dissolution of marriage, is unrealistic expectations, which, of course, unrealistic expectations in a spouse produce unmet expectations. In other words, you can't meet that which is not real. You can't fulfill that. And there really ought to be one expectation in marriage. Just one expectation. It's found in Ephesians 5.31. Two becoming one flesh. That's the one expectation God has in marriage. That's what I love about God. He makes it simple. Now, simple does not always mean easy. <laughs> but simple. Simple. To becoming one flesh is the expectation God has. And so, as we think about this, by way of introduction, what I want to point out, what I want us to think about as we look in God's Word is, what am I doing, not what is my spouse doing, but what am I doing by the grace of God to become one flesh? Or, what am I doing to impede becoming one flesh? What is God's expectation? God's expectation of marriage, as I already said, is to becoming one flesh. If my expectation is greater or lower, it's off. My expectation ought to be to becoming one flesh. We live in a society where the expectation is not to becoming one flesh. A society where the expectation is to trying out, see if it's even possible to become one flesh, and then if it does, well then we'll go through the next step. No, the expectation of marriage ought to be God's. Okay? As soon as I enter in that marriage covenant, it's two becoming one flesh. No questions. But I ought not to be greater. I ought not to attach all my expectations of what it means to be married on top of that. And put what I think it ought to be. No, it's two becoming one flesh. By the way, Moses records God saying this in Genesis. The prophet Malachi mentions it in the last book of the Old Testament. Jesus repeats this in Matthew 19, 5 and 6 and Mark 10, 8. And Paul reminds people of it in a, in a sexual context in 1 Corinthians 6, 16. And then Paul mentions it again in Ephesians 5, 31 as the purpose of marriage. Two becoming one flesh. Two becoming one. So, you get the idea when you see it mentioned over and over and over again. The first book in the Old Testament, the last book in the Old Testament. The Gospels and the letters. This is God's intent. This is God's expectation is two becoming one flesh. But what's the problem? That's God's ideal, right? Two becoming one? The problem is that the first marriage had an immediate rough patch. And I'm going to speak bluntly here, but Adam was a dullard who let his wife determine the spiritual direction of the family. That's what happened. <laughs> There's a reason Satan came to Eve. Adam was abdicating his responsibility as leadership. And, as a result, she was deceived, leading straight into destruction. Now, I know none of us here can blame them, because although we men might talk a big game, I know that if I were in the garden and my wife, God had just created in all her all-natural beauty and told us, my wife came to me and told us we ought to eat this fruit because it was wonderful, we'd, I think I would have done the same thing. <laughs> um, I'm not laying the blame on Adam and Eve, but the reality is Romans tells us that in Adam's sin, a sin nature was passed upon all. Therefore, the ideal is to becoming one flesh. The problem is we're selfish. And our flesh doesn't want to become one flesh because we say, I'm already one flesh, me. I've got that one flesh already. Now, I think it's kind of interesting how God did a reversal of this in Adam and Eve, didn't he? They were one flesh and he made them two. <laughs> he took from Adam and made Eve with the intent that in marriage now, it's just as if it was like Adam when he was one, two becoming one flesh. Marriage and parenting, both of them, teach us that we need the grace of God to become one flesh. 
The last thing that I want anyone to do is to go from...